These are an outstanding piece of engineering, the Alpine PDX M6. Now instantly I can tell you that this PCB is used for more than one model of amplifier. Look at this, we have four power supply FETs and two power supply transformers. However, this board can accommodate an extra one, two, three, four power supply MOSFETs and an additional transformer right there. On the output section, we have four output FETs in full bridge topology. We have one channel over here with one high, one low side FET, and another channel over here with another high side, low side FET, but we can accommodate again four more output MOSFETs if needed. Now I know you're gonna ask, can you just fit more parts to this and turn it into a more powerful amplifier? Yes and no. The main limiting factor of this amplifier is the transformers. They are stepping the 12 volts up to a higher voltage to use in the output section for the rail voltage. Now in the bigger version of this PCB, you would have different transformers to step the voltage up higher and an additional identical transformer here, therefore increasing current throughput and also higher rails, therefore higher power output before clipping. And the higher current draw from those higher rail voltages when pushed to clip point would require more MOSFETs. Now now if I fit more MOSFETs in the power supply and output section, that's all well and good, but the bottleneck is still going to be the transformers. So without changing these, the rail voltage stays the same, which means that it doesn't produce any more power at its nominal rated impedance anyway. And the only possible benefit you'd get from fitting more parts is you could maybe wire the amplifier down lower, say for example 0.5 ohms. And then you've got more parallel components to deal with that excessive current draw. However, the transformers are still the weak point and they might be saturated by the 0.5 ohm loads. So there's really nothing you can do. Just quickly looking over this then, we've got AUFP4004's monstrously powerful power supply FETs. Looks like we've got some drivers right by the FETs as well, possibly. We've got a TL494, pretty standard procedure in most car amplifiers, generating the PWM for the power supply section. Got some rail caps here, and the output MOSFETs are IRFB5615. Very fast MOSFETs, good for high frequency switching. This is probably going to have a quite a high switching frequency. It's not really necessary for a subwoofer mono amplifier, but it is kind of cool to see. This transformer over here is probably generating auxiliary supply voltages like plus minus 15 volts for the preamp, op amps, and the drive circuit, probably on the back of this PCB. I suspect the drive circuit for the output section is going to be in there somewhere. Yeah, I can already see what looks like it might be the start of an IC. Firstly, I've checked the output MOSFETs on the multimeter and found no shorts on there, so we can power it up and see what's wrong with this. This was purchased off eBay in its current state, so I don't actually know what's wrong with it other than it just didn't work. So 12 volts going in, nice low current, 4.2 amps to start with. Let's probe the high side drain, make sure we have a rail voltage. Yep, there we go, we have 43 volts worth of rail. Now let's probe the low side drain of this half of the bridge first, see if we get class D switching. Oh yes, class D switching at 354 kilohertz, nice and high for a subwoofer mono amplifier. Okay, let's check the other low side drain. Ah, there's nothing there. So basically only one channel, if you like, is working given that this is a full bridge amplifier. So it's not going to work properly. And we're going to need to dig into the drive circuit for this channel. We know we haven't got a supply voltage issue because if we did, neither of these channels would be working. So I suspect we've got a drive fault on this bank. So let's get this out of the rest of the heatsink. Have a look at the drive circuit on the back. So as expected, we have a city of surface mount components here on the back. Output drive circuit circuit, PWM generation circuit, probably protection stuff, all kinds of stuff going on on the back here. Now the drivers for the output FETs are these, they say abletech.com 612p. Now this might be confusing if you're an inexperienced amplifier technician with these because if you search this online you will find barely any information on these apart from perhaps an old DIY audio forum post with Perry Babin in it. I don't know the exact specifics but Alpine seem to be the only brand using these exact chips. It looks like they might have had them commissioned specifically for Alpine but I somehow doubt that. I don't know what the story is behind these. But basically these are IRS 20956. That part doesn't officially exist. There are no data sheets you can find for that part. It is practically identical to the IRS 20957. However, with a couple of the pins that swapped around, and I think it might have some slight 
differing functionality, but very minor. It's basically a 20957, but with the pins mixed around. And despite no data sheets for these officially existing, you can buy them from Chinese places like AliExpress, or I can't remember exactly where I bought these from, with varying levels of success. Some of them will be complete nonsense and just rebadged random chips, but some of them will actually work perfectly fine in this circuit. So this one is the working channel and the input to the drive IC is on pin 5. You can see here we've got a nice PWM there. So the first thing I want to do is see what's on pin 5 of the bad channel and see whether there's any PWM there as well. It's possible that this is a kind of self oscillating amplifier and we might not get any PWM on the input without the outputs kind of oscillating but I just want to see what's there anyway. So pin 5 we've got nothing there at all. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong with the circuit supplying it and one thing you can do with the self oscillating amplifiers actually inject some RCA signal there to actually get some PWM on the drive IC input without it oscillating. So let's try that. So as you can see, working channel with a little bit of signal going in, PWM, pulse width modulation in action there for you with 33 hertz going in. Let's check the bad channel, pin five absolutely nothing. So I don't think it's the drive I see. Although there's still a possibility it's bad and it's pulling these voltages down to ground so we can use the multimeter just to confirm there's no low resistance on the input pin to ground on this chip and if there's not we'll work our way back through this circuit. So on this one we have a gentle climb to 833 and on the bad channel we have exactly the same number so it's definitely not pulling it down inside. And before reverse engineering it too much one thing I want to try is because these are all surface mount semiconductors on here they can be very susceptible to heat and if one of them has failed internally or is on the brink of failing internally adding a little bit of heat to the area might actually cause the failed component to start miraculously working again for a moment or it might cause some slight change in the failure mode so let's get this side of the board heated up a little bit and monitor what it does on the scope so we're powered up with one amp idle current draw and no class D switching as of yet let's apply some heat around this area and just see if anything suddenly changes. Doesn't seem to be doing anything just yet. Oh, 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 wait a minute. Do you see that? What did I tell you? I'm gonna power cycle the board right now because it needs a little kick start at the beginning to get, there we go. There we go, look at that, what the f Okay, I was right. Now we know that there's some very, very gradually intermittently failing semiconductor component on this area somewhere with the heat it starts working. I'm gonna let it cool down again for a minute, spray some isopropyl alcohol just to get it cooled down nice and quick. And I'm gonna see if the issue comes back. I hope it does, because if the issue doesn't return, then I can't pinpoint what the faulty component was. So it's definitely had time to cool off. Hopefully this doesn't start switching straight away now. Oh, for goodness sake. Oh, this is gonna be annoying. I think the best thing to do for now is to just shut down the workshop, go and chill out, play some Legend of Zelda, and come back to this tomorrow, give the board time to settle again, and see if the issue returns tomorrow. If it doesn't return tomorrow, there's not really much I can do other than perhaps try the fridge. See you later, little guy. Right, it's a new day. Hopefully, the problem has returned. Let's give it some power, 12 volts. Ah, yes, I don't see any class E switching anymore. Fantastic. So I'm gonna heat it again and monitor it, but this time I'm gonna have the pressure super low and the temperature turned down as well. I'm only gonna have it at 100 degrees Celsius, and that's the temperature of the element, not of the air coming out of the tip. We've got a few different markings here, 1DW, KJD, 3DW. The 1D and 3D are just standard A42s and A44s. But the KJT is actually a tiny little switching dual diode. Now with this powered up, I'm gonna very gently heat Heat different areas of the board on this channel and I've got this razor blade here just to try and deflect any of the heat from areas I don't quite want to heat yet so I'm just starting off over here start off by heating these drive transistors down here at the bottom see if it starts switching or coming to life by heating those okay let's move on to the bootstrap diodes nothing here let's move on to the drive IC itself Okay, nothing there. Now let's move on to these SOT23 drive transistors. These are very, very tiny. I'm actually going to remove this. I'm going to try and heat each one individually to see which one causes this to start working. So let's start with this one over here. Ah, there we go. 
we suddenly have, now I know it's not switching yet, but that's because the amp's already powered up and it needs a little boost, a little kick start that the amplifier provides when we power up. There we go, suddenly it's working again. So I heated this area here. So Q3002, 3011, probably one of these two here that's causing the issue. So I guess for good measure, I might as well replace these five transistors here because that's definitely the area that I heated just now. So it's now been another whole day since those parts were replaced just to let the board settle and cool down fully. So let's power up and see whether that has solved it. Scope probe on low side drain. Let's build some rails. 